request this is the case of Mara Murray um, I'm vaguely familiar with the case and by vaguely I mean I've, I've heard about it in passing um, you know again I, I tell people I'm not into true crime like I like I was probably in my early 20s and as a teenager and in, in that era and I don't I still am interested in it, but I just don't follow it. And I don't search for it as much as I used to. But I think that gives me an advantage sometimes because I don't go down the rabbit holes. Like when I used to look at true crime, like Charles Manson, um, Jeffrey McDonald, I'd have to go to the library and search in their little index cards. I forget what they were called. Dewey Decimal System. And then I would read about it, check out a magazine and read about it. Not a lot of rabbit holes to go down when you do that. Nowadays, man, when I start to research something, there's just so many and so many inaccurate things that it's incredible. And you just have to allow yourself not to go down that hole. So I think for me, not being... Uh, into it as much allows me to look at it with a fresh set of eyes not go down the rabbit holes and concentrate on the facts a lot of these cases including this one with Mara Murray there's documents out there you know I read the the police report of the crash site um, some very other interesting facts that will go into victimology and I stayed away from as I always do I right? just stay away from web boards or uh, just those type of things I just I don't look at them and I don't put them into my consideration when I do an assessment or I look at a case I just look at the facts what's there and I try not to deviate from that too much um, so this case there was a disappeared episode on this and I did watch that Again, to me, it's almost, I don't know, I, you, like I've always say on documentaries, it, it has a narrative of its own, you know, it's not always straight facts or shows you everything or shows you only what they want you to see. So this case... You know, I, I hate rehashing cases, but there are some people that are watching this and probably don't know who that Mara Murray is or what the case is. So, I try to tell a story. And I don't think I'm that good of a storyteller, but I lay out the facts. And sometimes it might be jumping all over the place, but that's my style and that's how I do it. And if you don't like it, you can stop the video right now and go somewhere else. But for you that are still watching... Mara Murray was a college student, okay? I think in order to assess this case properly, victimology is going to be the, of paramount importance. Sometimes victimology, I say it's, it's good in every case. Sometimes it's, it's not needed. It's not really used too much, although I think in most cases it is. In this case, I think you can learn a lot from it. So, 
I always say in missing person cases, you know, I like to concentrate on the last 24. I'll go back 48 hours, sure. You can go back further than that, but you kind of concentrate on that. So what happened in this young girl's life within the last 48 hours of her disappearance? Well, this is what happens. This is the story. She's at University of Massachusetts, I believe, Amherst. I'm somewhat familiar with that because when I took my master's degrees uh, studies, it was at Massachusetts Lowell. Now, while there, this would have been, I believe, on February. See, now people will want to say, well, you don't know the timeline or, or this and that. And that way it shows you that you don't know what you're talking about the case. Timelines are not important in assessing a case. You know, if you're off by a day or two, it doesn't really matter. It, it's the facts of the case. But for the purpose of having a timeline, let me try to get, I, I want to say it was February 8th, but I want to, you know, I want to say that I'm sure of when this happened. So I believe, yes, it was February 8th. 8th February 9th is when she went missing but February 8th is when things started going out of whack for Miss Murray I believe on February 7th her dad had come up to meet her at the university her car was not running well it was not good and they were going to look for a new car. He withdrew $4,000 if my memory serves me right and they went up and looked for a new car. They didn't get a new car. Uh, around 9 o'clock that night or something to that effect, she asked if she could borrow her dad's car to go to a party. She goes to a party with, with a friend and on her way back, she was in an accident. Now, according to my notes, this happened at 0333. So at 3.33 a.m. on the 8th, she was in an accident in her dad's car. She is, the car is towed. She is taken by the police officer to the hotel room where her dad is staying. Apparently, from his statement that I read, his written statement that he gave to the police, she didn't wake him up. She went to bed. When she woke up at 10.30 in the morning, he woke up around 10. She told him, hey, I had an accident with your car. It's towed. She was depressed about it. According to the father, Fred, he said uh, it felt like she let me down. That Meaning, she felt that way. He did not. He, he uh, tells her, hey, don't worry about it. Did you get a ticket? And she says, no. She had drank that night, and that bothers me. Well, it doesn't bother me, but it stands out to me that she was at a party that night. She had quit drinking earlier, so they didn't give her a breathalyzer. But I, I am betting... Through victimology from everything that I've researched that she was intoxicated there that's going to be important okay she didn't get a ticket they didn't give her a breathalyzer and actually they took her home he eventually goes home she goes you know back to her dorm and now it is February 9th and let me go right to the page here so I don't mess anything up. There was going to be a snowstorm. Class classes were going to be more than likely canceled. However, she started doing some research on places to rent in Vermont. Condos, stuff like that. She printed out a map quest, if you remember those, for directions to a condo. 
Her telephone log indicated that she made calls up there to rent condo. She didn't tell anybody about this. At some point in the day, she packed up her car. Not with everything. You know, belongings. She had her studies with her, meaning her syllabus, her books. She also had her running gear with her. She was a cross-country and track um, athlete at college. So she leaves the dorms. She Before leaving the dorms, she sends an email to her professor of some sort and says, there was a death in my family. I won't be able to be in class all next week. Or this week. I'm not sure if it was the previous week. Regardless, she lied. Um, now, I was just thinking back. They had interviewed her boyfriend's mom on this disappeared episode. And she said, yes, she, Maura lied about that. But she wasn't a liar. And I kind of chuckled because I was like, well, wait a second. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> she just lied. But I know what she meant. Okay. It wasn't normal for her to lie. I will challenge that later on in this assessment. But she leaves the dorms. She's got her map quest to um, Vermont, Burlington. No idea where she's going. Nobody knows anything other than she's leaving. So on her trip, before she starts on it, she stops at an ATM machine. She withdraws $280. Now, I hear that that was basically all that she had available to her, but I don't know that. I, I, that would be significant to know how much she left in her bank account, but I don't know that. But she withdrew a lot. Then she went to the liquor store, and she spent money on Bailey's, Kahlua, vodka, and a box of red wine. Well, I know that the Kahlua and the, the Baileys and the vodka, that's for white Russians. And from reading a report that I believe the dad had given, she had drinking black Russians while he was there. So I know that more than likely that was for her. Victimology would tell you that as well. You talk to her friends and family, find out what she would drink. It's a lot of alcohol to take with you um, if you were just leaving to go somewhere and, and come back, right? So we can assume, based off of the map quest, the phone calls that she made up there looking for a condo, and that liquor, that she was planning on getting away. Now her state of mind is very important here because she is somewhat depressed. Her father described her as whimpering at one point in time while she was, he was driving her after this accident and him telling her it'd be okay. $280 and a car full of booze. And you're heading out. Now, she, there had been a couple phone calls en route, I think, either to or from a boyfriend, what might have been one. This boyfriend she had met when she was at West Point Academy. And we'll get into more about that later. But according to the Disappeared episode, she had left West Point and transferred to UMass. There's more to that, which is important. So basically, let's get to 7.27 that night. She's been driving now for, what, three hours, something to that extent. By all intent and purposes, the, same, the route that MapQuest has taken her to get to Burlington, Vermont. She wrecks her car. Kind of a hairpin turn. Roads are bad. She wrecks. 
The car hits a snowbank, hits a tree, spins around. Witness called police. Another witness actually was on the scene. He was a bus driver. He pulled up. He sees her, asks if she's okay. He says she was okay. She had no visible injuries, although she was cold and uh, shaken up. He said he was going to call police, and she told him not to. And in one report I read said she pleaded. And then she said, I already called trip away. Well, he had known that there was no cell service there, so she probably didn't, but, you know, whatever. He goes home. He calls the police, reports it. Police show up about 10 minutes later, and she's gone. Never been seen again. So what can we what can we start deducing from eyewitness reports at the scene? One thing is that the police officer noticed red stains on the ceiling of the vehicle and on the driver's side door. He also noticed a soda bottle of some sort that had remnants of red in it. And on the driver's side door, a stain in the snow that was red. Okay, what does that tell me? That tells me she was drinking alcohol, more than likely the red wine. She was disguising that in a soda bottle. So as to not be suspicious of driving while drinking. I'm not going to say driving while intoxicated. Because you don't know if she was intoxicated, right? But you know she was drinking. She was either drinking that at the time of the impact. And it went everywhere. Or if the impact was significant enough. If it was in a cup holder. I guess it could have sprayed everywhere. But my thinking is she was actually taking a, a drink of it at the time when the accident occurred. And it went where it did. After she regained her little composure there for a minute, after realizing what happened, first thing she does is dump that bottle out the driver's side door because she doesn't want to be caught drinking and driving. Remember what I said about the accident that she had with her dad's car previous? So within two days, she has two accidents. Both, in my opinion, involving alcohol. Now, the first one has no indication of that, but she's at a party. Um, I see nowhere that she was a DD. She had been drinking earlier that night with her father. And the accident happens at 3, 3, 3 in the morning. To me, there was alcohol involved. Whether she was drunk, whether the cop didn't give her a breathalyzer test, whatever it was. I guarantee if he would have, there would have been some alcohol in her system. It might not have been over the legal limit, but it involved alcohol. The car is locked. That's also a very significant indicator to me that she was, I won't say there was stuff in that car I, that she did not want taken because she locked the car right but what's missing from the car her cell phone her credit cards and in some accounts the liquor now what I did not read is whether she used a purse because I have a hard time believing that she would just be carrying liquor down the street like that after an accident that doesn't make sense right because she had just dumped out alcohol so I don't know if the reports about that liquor is or true but I could see maybe she would take them if she had a bag of some sort a backpack that she took with her a purse Why does she leave the scene of that accident? It's obvious to me that she did not want to be 
dealt with by police because she was intoxicated. She, it was, she wrecked the car and she was driving while impaired. Now let's jump back to Mara's victimology. She was at West Point, a place where you need good character. You know, I was in the Marine Corps for four years. I know the military lifestyle. Integrity should be always number one. I believe that in life, and I believe that certainly in the military and law enforcement. While at West Point, she meets her boyfriend, like I had stated. And I, the disappeared episode said that she transferred from West Point to UMass. But they gave no explanation on that. So I do some research and I find that she actually stole possibly some makeup from the commissary. So a commissary is just like a grocery store. It's like a Walmart. But it's on base. And she was confronted with this. She pled guilty to it. And she transferred. Now whether it was a forced she was forced out of West Point or she voluntarily agreed to leave. I don't know. And would that make a difference in my thought process? I think it would. Because if she was not forced to leave and she did it on her own accord because of this, it tells me that she runs away from her problems. Now, if she got booted out, okay, well, now it explains why she's at UMass. And now she's continuing this long-distance relationship with the boyfriend. So while at UMass, she is arrested for stealing somebody's credit card. She used the credit card numbers to make purchases for uh, a couple of days at a couple of different restaurants for food. She would call in the order, give the credit card information, the delivery driver would bring it. This was reported to police on November 4th, 2003. Okay. Now these dates are important to me. November 4th, 2003. She goes missing February 9th, 2004. When she's confronted by police officers about this credit card theft, she reluctantly admits it. She shows them where she had written down the credit card numbers on a note card. Uh, she would not give a statement, written statement. She wouldn't say how she got those numbers other than to say she found them on a receipt. Um, but fr from what I read, the case did not, I mean, she admitted guilt to the police officers, but the, the, the case had not made its way through the court system yet. Now it's not a felony. It's probably only a summary offense because it's under, well, in Pennsylvania, you know, under $250, I think, or, or whatever it was is a summary offense. You just basically get a ticket. But it still hadn't made it through there. From what I see, I saw a note that said continued until March 30th of 04. That's important to me. Remember what she did at West Point where she ran away from her problems, maybe, if she wasn't kicked out. So this is still being continued. It hasn't worked its way through the court system yet and she again is leaving now when police looked and did a search of her dorm apartments and this is what is the most perplexing to me her items were boxed up her knickknacks and art and posters and stuff were taken off of the wall there was a note printed out, an, e an email of some sort to the boyfriend 
laying on top of those boxes. The contents of that note, I don't know about other than it was deemed that there was problems in the relationship. So here you have a girl who is, I, I believe, not what is seen on the surface. You have somebody that wrecked her dad's car, and I believe it was probably due to alcohol. You have a girl who is in the midst of an ongoing legal issue, no matter how big or small it is. This is at least the second time this has happened. A character type of issue and then she wrecks the car that's compounding the problems and that's the backstory okay so what happened to her well I'm not a psychic I will say that the prevalent thought from what I've researched seems to be that people think that she was picked up by a serial killer of some sort. Listen, guys, it doesn't... That Does that happen? Sure. That's possible. But it's not probable. When you take into account everything else that was going in this girl's life, is it possible that she was at the wrong place at the wrong time? Yes. Yes, it is. Is that probable? I don't believe so, based off the evidence and the victimology that I just saw. I believe that she was she wanted to get away. She was running away from her problems. Now, was she running away forever? I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because the little amount that she had packed. All those boxes being packed up at the dorm could indicate she was planning on, on running from that problem. Okay? Just like at West Point. She was going to pack up and go. Maybe it was an embarrassment. Maybe nobody knew about this. Probably, I guarantee you, nobody knew about West Point either. She was putting up a fake front. It's like I talk about all the time. You know how many times, you know, I've done search warrants at people's houses when I was a, a detective and a, and a patrol officer, both. You, you never would expect the things that you find. You, you know, you're out there talking to them as a neighbor, you know, everything. You do a search warrant in someone's house and the stuff that you find, you're like, oh my, never would have thought it. So, to me, she isn't what she seems. Yes, her family and friends all think that she's great and, and I, I'm not saying that she wasn't. But we all have skeletons. We all have things that people don't know about us. She didn't tell anybody where she was going. Did she, was there any bad intent? I don't think so. I think she wanted to get away. And maybe think about things for a little bit. Was she planning on committing suicide like some people have thought? No, not at that point. I don't believe so. Because if, if you planned on it, now one person, the boyfriend's mother said, well, she didn't write a note. Listen, more often than not, you don't know how many suicides that I've looked at there was no note and it's a clear-cut suicide okay people don't always leave notes that's a fallacy it really is but I don't believe that she had left that apartment to go to Burlington to commit suicide if an indicator of that would be buying a lot of booze so she did do that you know I had a suicide once where the guy stopped and he bought uh, two bottles of vodka, bought a bunch of uh, Red Man Chew, 
you know, and I'm looking in his truck and I'm looking at the receipt and I'm like, what, why would he buy all of that knowing that the liquor is sure to work up the courage to do it, but why all the red man chew, you know, when you know you're going to go kill yourself. And it was no doubt that he had hung himself, um, but he did. This is what he did. It doesn't have to have an explanation to it. But some of the other characteristics that are not an indication of suicide to me is when she left the car, she locked it. Now, why, why do that? Is it out of habit? Possibly. Very possibly. Now, I will, I will throw in the thought of suicide after the accident. After the second accident. Now, she was upset and kind of depressed after the first accident. Okay? Maybe so much so that she packed up her stuff and said, I'm out of here. I'm going to leave. But for right now, hey, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to withdraw some money and I'm going to go get a cabin up in Burlington, Vermont, where my family had gone in the past. And then on the way up there, she has a second accident and she's drunk. Now she has a court case already pending. She has one accident. Now she just has two. Okay. Now the thought of suicide. I can, I can entertain that now. But how? Oh, you'll say, well, anybody can hang themselves. Sure. Yes. Very possible. I can entertain that thought now. Especially with her being intoxicated. But that would mean that she would have to more than likely go into the woods and hang herself. I want to know how much money was found in that car, if any. If none, and if she spent, I don't know, $40 for the booze, that leaves her $240, $40 for gas, so now she has $200. She has $200 in her pocket when she leaves there. It's 7 something at night. Are there any stores in the area? I'm sure that was checked out where she could buy an implement to hang herself. There was no, there was two and a half feet of snow from what I saw. There was no indication of footprints in that snow. Now that is troublesome to me. That indicates that she was walking along the road and nobody saw her. Is it possible that she was picked up by somebody with nefarious intent? Yes. But do I believe that? No. I leave that as a possibility, but not a probability. So what happened? I mean, what do you, what do you think? Everybody has their own opinions, but the evidence in the victimology tells me that she was certainly upset when she left but not enough to kill herself the second accident occurred she begged not to call police because she was intoxicated she was running away again running away from the problems would these are the two things that i would not be surprised about i would not be surprised if she was found alive somewhere number two I would not be surprised if she was her body was found in those woods somewhere within five miles of where that car wrecked. It would depend on her level of intoxication. I'd want to know those that wine bottle. How much was drinking out of that? We don't know if the other the Kahlua and the Baileys and the vodka. If they weren't there, we don't know. How much was drinking but if she had drinking a lot of alcohol and went into those woods 
And I, I left out a part where the boyfriend received a voicemail on his phone. Um, what was? I, I don't even know the time frame because I only heard it briefly, only once by him. But it was that next morning. And he could hear a girl whimper. It's the same adjective that the father had used. And breathing like she was crying. And no message was left. And they hung up. And it was from a prepaid card, which she was known to use. And the boyfriend believed it was, it was her. Now, if she was in trouble, why wouldn't she leave a message if she was being held against her will? Why wouldn't she say, hey, help me, at least? If she was lost in the woods, why wouldn't she leave a message? You know, the only person that knows the answer to that is Mara. Maybe the phone died. Maybe the minutes ran out before she could leave a message. I, it's all speculation. But when a person dies, it's either by natural causes, homicide, suicide, or accident. And in this case, all four are into play because we don't have a body. And that's if somebody dies. That's not taken into account that somebody is kidnapped and held against their will or if they decided to get away. If you remember the case of Michelle Whitaker, and if you are unfamiliar with that, go back through my videos and look. Everyone was certain she succumbed to foul play because she was dropped off at a truck stop and what, you know, puts fright into young hitchhiking women more than being at a truck stop. She didn't, her family said she would never leave her dog she would never leave her family. We just know that something bad happened to her. She's dead. Probably a trucker. And lo and behold, 10 years later, she's alive and living in a different state. Started a whole new life and didn't want anything to do with her family. So it happens. Not everything is foul play. I do not believe that an opportunistic serial killer or murderer happened upon her at 7 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock at night, and decided to kidnap her and kill her. That's not what the victimology tells me. It, it tells me of a young, confused person who is having an avalanche of problems, no matter how small we think those problems are. Everybody handles everything differently. She thinks that this the whole world is com coming in on her. Having boyfriend problems. Disappointing dad wrecking his car. Now I wreck my car and it's inoperable and I can't move it. I've been drinking. I have this pending legal case back there. It's all crashing in on me. I can't take it. And what gets more people confused and emotional other than being intoxicated? That amplifies. Every bad choice I've ever made in my life, I was under the influence of alcohol. I could see her wandering down the road for a little ways, going into the woods. And, and think about this. And hunters will tell you this. And I used to be a hunter, so I know. When you are going into the woods, you're going to find the least obstructed way to go into those woods. Meaning, you'll walk along a road that has piles of snowbank on it, so you don't have to go into that snowbank until you find an opening. And then you go into it. Now, would she do this on purpose? I don't know. I would want to know whether, see, she did not know whether the cops were being called or not, right? If someone said, I'm calling the cops, then I can see her going into those woods. 
to avoid apprehension. But she didn't know that the cops were being called. She may have thought it. I don't know what the exact words that the bus driver gave, he, you know, after she said, no, don't call them. I already called AAA. And he went home and called them himself. But there was a witness in a, a house up further who saw, you know, the wreck. And he they called police. She certainly did not want to be around that car. She didn't want people to know that she was there drinking and had a wreck. So where would she have gone? She absolutely could have hitchhiked. But I, if she did, I think people would have saw her. Is it possible that she went into the woods and tried to wait it out? Wait to see when the police came, how long they were there? possible but she already knows that that car is inoperable she can't drive it and the police are going to tow it anyhow so she would have to go to the police station to get it out so let's assume that she does that let's say she's waiting around police exit the scene around nine o'clock at night so she's been in the woods for two and a half hours maybe watching all this take place wondering what she's going to do She doesn't want to involve anybody, so she's not going to call anybody. And maybe she's planning on, you know, trying to dig that car out or whatever it is, but the police take it. Now she's stuck without a vehicle. Now what do you do? Well, she has a cell phone, so wouldn't that be the time to call for help? But would, who's she going to call? She's going to call her dad and say, I just wrecked another car. I was drinking. Come get me. Depends on their relationship. If you listen to his interviews, you know, him saying, I miss my buddy and all this. You would think that that would be an option. But she didn't do that, right? Wouldn't lead me to believe more. That she just left. But. Boy. I don't know because. She doesn't seem like she's the most criminal savvy person. By that I mean wouldn't. She took her credit cards with her. She only had about $200 left I'm guessing. That's not going to get you too far. Unless, you know, how would she survive on just that? The police, I'm sure, or the family checked those credit cards and they probably never used again. So, I mean, it's possible. It's certainly possible. But I would put that down there, too. I would take out a homicide. I would probably take out her running away. And I would be more inclined to believe that she got turned around in those woods. And her phone died. It's cold. And she succumbed to the elements. Not like that would be the first time that's happened. That's happened countless times times to people if, if she was intoxicated that gives you a, a, a sense of warmth you know and maybe uh, you know if she wasn't a smoker she probably didn't have any fire uh, starter with her you know matches or anything you drink more alcohol to keep you warm when in actuality that is worse for you because it gives you a false sense of warmth I don't know what type of coat she had. I imagine it was a winter coat of some sort. But still, she was a hiker. She was athletic. That makes the most sense to me. It really does, based off of everything.
that I that I that I saw. I would still leave open the possibility of an opportunistic killer, but there's no evidence of that. There's just no evidence of that. There's more evidence of her running away based on what she did in her past than there is of her being a victim of homicide. I would think more than likely she succumbed to the elements out there when she was trying to wait it out. You know, I can envision certainly <clears throat> her walking up the road a ways, finding a trail that didn't have a lot of snow or whatnot, going in there far enough away so she could still have eyes on, on her car and the police activity around it. Then they start searching for her. Right down in there, you know, the police are looking for her. The big search didn't take place for a couple of days after when they brought brought the bloodhounds in and stuff. And the bloodhounds lost her scent uh, about 50 feet in the middle of the road. And people want to say, well, that means that she got in a car. No, that doesn't. That's not what it means. So I could see them, her, her watching the vehicle from in, in the wooded area. Um, you know, you're far enough away where you can see the lights. And all of a sudden now, the police are out with flashlights. And now they're looking for you. In your intoxicated state, you still don't want to be caught. You take off a little bit further in the woods, a little bit further. It doesn't take long to get turned around. Now, I know that those woods have been set, searched extensively. But I know of other places and other cases where woods have been searched extensively and they missed it. So... I could see that that, to me, is more of the, the probable than the possible. I'm going to go down through my notes here, read off some things that I've written down just so I didn't miss anything. Remember, when you write things down, it's because they're important to you. You see something, you want to write them down. I put, she wanted to get away because the second accident, she was in deep depression. Her items were packed at the dorm. I have a question mark there. And her artwork and stuff was taken down off the walls. That is indicative of me of somebody that's getting ready to leave college. And it's the exact same thing that she did at West Point when she got caught stealing there. So I won't label her a thief. But I will label her as some. she, she was somewhat troubled. For what for that for what that's worth. Calls rental place. She withdrew her money. <clears throat> she got her liquor. She was definitely drinking on the way, and I wrote that. She walked in the woods. Question mark. I have suicide, natural causes, run away. What were all the items in the car that she left? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I know some of it, the stuff that she had left there. No note, question mark, and I wrote that because of what the boyfriend's mom had said. Her car was locked, two and a half feet of snow, which to me, again, would show footprints in the snow if she went in the snow in that direction. But like I said, as a hunter, I know you travel the path of least resistance. So you're going to walk up that road until you find a trail of some sort that dips into those woods. The red wine on the driver's side of the door ceiling, I think that's an indication that she was actually imbibing in the alcohol when she wrecked. I have written down here the first accident when she wrecked her dad's car at 0333, not drunk, question mark. And the police gave her a ride to the motel, question mark. That's just odd to me because you don't do that nowadays think she would have gotten a breathalyzer test nowadays at least to see her level of intoxication her past credit card theft and it being continued so that was still pending while she was while this accident and disappearance happened um I, the last thing i've written down here is no suicide how would she with what? 
And I think I've covered that. And again, I don't think it was planned suicide. I, you know, she wasn't going, leaving her dorms to go to Vermont to kill herself. Because on the way, she picked up these accident report uh, paperwork and triplicates that her dad needed for the insurance company. You wouldn't do that if you were getting ready to commit suicide. Now, after she wrecked the car, then okay, then suicide may have crossed her mind. And I believe that. But how? She could hang herself with her own piece of clothing, sure. There's ways to do it. But I don't find that that's, that's probable. I think that she got turned around in those woods. But I can't rule out the other things either. So to me, that's the most probable. Or <clears throat> she ran away. <coughs> Excuse me. She certainly has a history of that, of running away from her problems. She just doesn't look like she has the financial means. But when I think of Michelle Whitaker, she had no means. And when they interviewed Michelle Whitaker later, she said, I was in a restaurant. I had no money, but I was so hungry. And I ordered the food anyway, knowing that there was no way I could pay it. And it made me feel horrible. Luckily, the guy behind me, he paid for my food. And she disappeared. Started a whole new life over. This could be the exact same thing. She doesn't have to have the means in order to do it. All she needed is some helping hands. So if I had to rank them, I would say she succumbed to the elements after getting turned away around in those woods somewhere after hiding from the police because she was intoxicated. Number two, I would say that she ran away start a new life she was embarrassed she had a history of doing that I think that is number two now her friends and family would certainly disagree with that but I've seen it happen um, but that would be number two based off of the evidence that I see three three and four would be a tie no three would be a suicide and family and friends would disagree with that as well. But based off of everything that was happening, going on in her life right then, I think it is a possibility. And four, the last is, to me, her getting picked up by somebody to kill her. That's the least probable, in my opinion. Now... Again, I'm looking at this as unbiased set of eyes that haven't gone down any of the rabbit holes looking at the evidence. And that's what I see. Agree or disagree. You know, that's that's what I see. So that was an elite member's request. Remember, if you want to be an elite member and request case, uh, go to my page on YouTube and then click on the... Uh, the join the membership tab and and join and grow the and join the growing numbers there and uh, I think that's about all I have to say on this case very intriguing I will have to go and look for updates I did just see an update I looked at the date and it was November so this month there was an update they had found remains somewhere but it it was confirmed that it wasn't hers so she's still out there hopefully alive somewhere you know that would be my hope feel bad for her family and friends and just like I do all missing person cases that's my assessment on this case Maura Murray disappeared February 9th 2004 hope she's found and I hope she's found alive so until next time Maine's out I won't fear of